Hello, everyone, and thank you for coming to my talk. Uh, my name is Owen Bissett, and I am a postdoc at the Institute for Bioscience and Biotechnology Research, which is a joint institute between the University of Maryland and the National Institutes of Standards and Technology, NIST. I'd like to thank the event organizers for inviting me to come give this talk. Uh, the title for today will be Structural Fingerprinting of Short Oligonucleotide Therapeutics by High Resolution Solution NMR Spectroscopy. Uh, by the end of this talk, I hope that everyone will understand how NMR spectra can be used as structural fingerprints of short oligonucleotide therapeutics and to understand how these methods can be applied to a variety of structural features, including both native and non-native chemistries. And I'll get in a little later into what that is. Uh, short oligonucleotide therapeutics are an emerging class of biopharmaceuticals to treat a wide variety of diseases, including those that are inaccessible to current protein-based and small molecule-based approaches. Um, as you can see here, the first uh, Short oligonucleotide drug uh, approved by the FDA occurred in 1998, and since then we've seen an increase in the number of uh, short oligonucleotide drugs that are being approved. Generally, uh, short oligonucleotide drugs are either antisense oligonucleotides, or ASOs, or short interfering RNAs, siRNAs, the exception being macigen here, which is an aptamer. Almost all ASOs uh, silence gene expression via an RNA H-dependent degradation, whereas the siRNAs use the RNA interference pathway. One of the main hurdles um, in developing these uh, short oligonucleotides into therapeutics uh, are due to uh, overcoming their poor pharmacological properties. So nucleic acids are inherently unstable, so drug development, uh, drug development requires overcoming uh, their inherent instability and also aiding in their delivery to target organs. In terms of stability, uh, changes in formulation conditions, including the pH, the salinity, and the ligo cord concentration all need to be optimized, but that will only get you so far. Uh, a lot of chemical modifications are actually introduced into these molecules. So shown on the right is a short is a residue from a short oligonucleotide therapeutic. Um, and modifications are done uh, at the backbone. So these include phosphorothioate linkages, the sugar region, uh, two prime methyls and two prime fluoros are often added at the two prime position to render the reactive hydroxyl group uh, inert. Uh, you don't see these as often, but you can also have base modifications, including 5-methylcytidine. And in some instances, entirely different chemistries are used, such as phosphodiamidite morpholinos um, and peptide nucleic acids. So really, all of these chemical modifications are added to kind of increase the stability of the oligonucleotide so that it won't be uh, degraded once it enters the body. Uh, the second uh, property that needs to be improved are the drug delivery. Um, won't, I won't be discussing this very much in this talk, but uh, common techniques involve using lipid nanoparticles or an acetogalactosamine conjugation. So there are plenty of different areas uh, during the drug manufacturing and distribution process where uh, impurities can be generated. Um, common techniques, cur current uh, analytical techniques to uh, characterize the purity um, and identity of uh, short oligonucleotides uh, include mass spectrometry and liquid chromatography. Um, but these uh, oligonucleotides can undergo a variety of different degradation pathways, including depurination, which is shown on the right. In this uh, case, a adenine or guanine base is removed and that leaves an abasic site. These are considered uh, harmful uh, due to the great measures the body goes through to actually resolve these abasic sites. Uh, other examples include hydrolytic cleavage, so the oligonucleotide is broken up into smaller units, uh, desulfurization, so the phosphorothioates 
um, lose their soil firm uh, and get replaced with oxygen. You can also have different cross-linking reactions and deamination. So all of these uh, different degradation pathways can lead to potentially harmful impurities. Um, and if they're not harmful, they at least would lower the drug efficacy. Therefore, techniques are needed to uh, not only uh, identify the impurities, but also uh, determine the, the level of impurity. Um, Solution NMR is a high-resolution structural technique that provides uh, information on short oligonucleotides under full formulation conditions. And these methods could nicely complement current mass spec and uh, liquid chromatography-based approaches. So shown on the left in A is a siRNA. And if we highlight all of the hydrogens shown in B, you can see that these are very well dispersed throughout the entire molecule. And all of these hydrogens are readily uh, accessible via NMR techniques. So for each hydrogen atom, so there's in panel B, a purple box around one of the hydrogens, uh, you get a particular signal in an NMR spectra shown in C. So the chemical shift is along the X, and this provides information on the local chemical environment and hence structure uh, surrounding that uh, hydrogen. And the intensity of that signal conveys information on uh, dynamics. So if you collect these types of measurements throughout the entire molecule, you get an overall picture of the structure and dynamic of the uh, oligonucleotide. So as our group has demonstrated with uh, monoclonal antibodies, NMR data can be used as inputs for chemometric analysis to determine subtle changes in structure and purity. The goal of my project is to extend these methods from monoclonal antibodies into short oligonucleotide therapeutics. To aid in the development of our NMR methods, we developed a model siRNA shown here um, for NMR benchmarking purposes. The model siRNA is modeled after currently FDA-approved drugs and includes a lot of the chemical modifications that are found in the therapeutic class, including 2 prime methyls, 2 prime fluoros, and phosphorothiolate linkages. We also have a randomly generated sequence to remove any sequence bias, and it's capped with terminal GC-based parasitic stability. This SI, model siRNA is also prepared at natural isotopic abundance to match the conditions in which these drugs are synthesized, and it's formulated in a buffer closely matching those of other FDA-approved therapeutics. Within the model siRNA, you have both what we call native and non-native chemistries. So the native chemistries uh, include uh, your bases like uh, ad adenosine, guanosine, uh, uridine, and cytidine, which are found in uh, all RNAs or uh, in some DNAs. But then we also have non-native chemistries, and these include uh, bases like 5-fluorouridine, um, as well as some of the modified sugars like 2'-fluoro and 2'-methyl. Um, and you also have non-native chemistries at the backbone region, such as phosphorothiolates. So initially, I'll discuss 1D uh, NMR fingerprints. So these methods report on a particular type of atom. So shown here, uh, we have uh, all the hydrogens. So those are proton NMR. Uh, in B, you have all the phosphorus. But, and then in C, you have all the fluorines. And as you can see, these nuclei are dispersed throughout the molecule in varying degrees. Uh, the hydrogens are found throughout, whereas the phosphoruses are found along the backbone and then the fluorines are kind of sprinkled in throughout the molecule um, at the sites of either 5-fluoro-U or 2 prime fluoro modification. So the first uh, data I'll show you is from the 1D proton NMR, and as you can see, uh, these spectra are rather complex. This is due to the over 400 hydrogens that are actually located within the siRNA, uh, which is shown in A. 
So each one of those hydrogens potentially gives rise to a signal and there is only a limited amount of space in, in chemical shift over which all of those signals can resonate. So in this case, it's about 15 ppm. So we can kind of break up the different regions into belonging to a particular class. For instance, around uh, 1 to 2 ppm, we have the methyl H7s. Um, but within, you know, the, the 1 to 9 ppm range, it's very hard to assign these or uh, determine much about them from just a simple 1D proton experiment. The exception being the amino region, which is boxed and uh, kind of expanded around the uh, 12 to 14 ppm range. These signals report on hydrogen bonding. So in the event of a base pair, the amino proton is protected from solvent exchange and therefore gives rise to a detectable signal. Whereas in the absence of base pairing, these signals broaden beyond detection. So essentially each peak represents a single hydrogen bond. And one thing you'll notice is we have numbers above all of these signals, uh, and these represent assignments. So in contrast to our previous work with MOBs, which are these very large, very complex uh, proteins, uh, the relative simplicity, simplicity of the siRNA therapeutics allows for their chemical shift assignment, which adds a new level of detail, so basically atomic level insight um, into the siRNA, which is very nice. Another 1D experiment we can do is a phosphorus measurement. So in A is the siRNA with all of its phosphorus is shown as spheres. And as you can see, we have two kind of clusters that show up in the 1D phosphorus experiment. Uh, we have a group of signals around 0 ppm. These correspond to the phosphates, so phosphorus bound to oxygen. And around 60 ppm, we have the phosphorothioates. Um, so we can see that there's a very large separation in chemical shift between the phosphorothioates and the phosphates. However, within each group, a lot of the signals are kind of piled on top of each other, making it very hard to uh, learn much about them. With the phosphorothioates, so remember that each one of these phosphorothioates uh, can be in one of two diastereomers, either the RP or the SP configuration. And as it turns out, the different diastereomers resonate in different windows. Uh, which is shown in B. So even though this region is rather cluttered, we can actually uh, pick out the different diastereomers, and this kind of 1D uh, spectra serves as kind of a fingerprint for the overall distribution of the different diastereomers um, within the oligonucleotide sample and can therefore help in ensuring batch to batch reproducibility. The last 1D measurement I'll show you is for the uh, fluorine spectra, is the fluorine spectra. So these are probably the most uh, simplified spectra due to the fewer number of fluorines than phosphorus and hydrogen. And as you can see here, both the 5 fluoro U's and the 2 prime fluoros, they resonate in distinct chemical shift regions, and we're able to assign them. So even though there are fewer fluorines compared to the hydrogens and the phosphoruses, due to their distribution throughout the oligonucleotide, uh, they actually capture a lot of the structure of the oligonucleotide. So in conclusion, the 1D NMR fingerprints provide a rapid initial uh, assessment of the sample quality, but are relatively low resolution. These experiments can be acquired with uh, in about 30 seconds, as is the case with the 1D proton measurements, the phosphorus and the fluorine measurements can be completed in about five minutes. So really, they're rather rapid um, kind of methods. One way we can improve the resolution and there, uh, is by extending the 1D fingerprint into a second dimension. So shown here, uh, in A is the siRNA, in B we have all the hydrogens uh, shown, and what we can do in a 2D NMR measurement is now select only the hydrogens that are attached to a particular heteroatom, which in this case is going to be nitrogen. And as you can see, that therefore cuts down the, number, the total number of hydrogens that we're looking at, and now we're only looking at hydrogens that are bound to nitrogen. 
For those of you that are unfamiliar with what a 2D NMR data set looks like, uh, this uh, little schematic should help out. So here in A, we have the siRNA with all the proton nitrogen pairs labeled. Each one of those proton nitrogens uh, is going to give a signal that's going to look like something in B. So just like with the 1D measurement, we have the proton chemical shift along the X. But now along Y, we have the heteroatom chemical shift, so in this case, N15. And then kind of in the third dimension coming out of the page uh, in the Z direction, this is your intensity. So just like a 1D measurement, a 2D uh, correlation has information on uh, the local chemical structure via the chemical shifts of the two uh, atoms, the proton and the nitrogen, but it all, and it also has information on dynamics, and that's uh, via the uh, intensity. In the um, siRNAs, there are several uh, both native and non-native chemistries that can act as NMR probes. So you have the proton nitrogen correlations. These include uh, the aminos. So these are involved in base pairing. You can also have a long-range aromatic proton nitrogen experiment. Uh, and then you also have proton carbon, and these come in uh, a variety of different uh, versions, so you have your aromatics, methyls, 2 primo methyls, and deoxyribose, and you can select the different correlations by tuning the scalar coupling between uh, the hydrogen and its um, and the heteroatom. Uh, we also have uh, proton fluorine correlations that are possible with these modified oligos, as well as proton phosphorus correlations, which I will not really discuss in this talk. So here is a 2D amino proton nitrogen uh, experiment, and as you can see, uh, it's similar to the uh, 1D amino spectra. This defines the overall secondary structure of the oligonucleotide. What's nice about uh, the 2D version, though, is now you have your U or 5-fluor uh, U signals separated from the G signals by the nitrogen chemical shift. So you see at the top around 145 to 150 ppm, all the G amino signals resonate. And then around 160 to 165 ppm in the nitrogen dimension, this is where all the U's um, and fluor U's resonate. Uh, so this is a very nice experiment. And it, once again, each signal corresponds to a particular uh, base pair. Um, one of the limitations of this method, though, um, is that you need to be at relatively cool temperatures and uh, slightly acidic buffers in order to ensure that the exchange rate of those amino protons is low and therefore you get decent signals. One way to bypass that is to do a so-called long-range proton nitrogen experiment, in which case the adenine H2s are correlated to the nitrogen N1 and N3s. And the resulting spectra is shown here. For each A, we have each A in the sequence, you get um, signals for each of those. And what's nice about this, once again, is that you don't need cool temperatures and you don't need acidic buffer conditions to get really good data. Um, one of the main limitations with the proton nitrogen experiments are the relatively long experiment times, which range from half a day for the amino region to one and a half days for this long range proton nitrogen experiment. Shown here is a 2D aromatic proton carbon spectra, and this provides information on base stacking. So this, uh, the proton carbon correlations report on both base paired and unbase paired regions, and they are unaffected by solvent exchange, unlike the amino proton nitrogen correlations. And as you can see for our model siRNA, we have three distinct regions defined by the carbon uh, chemical shift. So up at the top of the spectra, you have all the five fluorouracils. Uh, in the middle, you have the adenine, guanine, uh, cytidine, uridine, and thymidine uh, aromatic uh, proton carbon correlations. And at the bottom, you have all of the uh, adenine H2C2 correlations. What we can also do with uh, proton carbon experiments is we can look at some of the 
non-native chemistry. So shown here is the uh, two prime methyl spectra. Normally in nucleic acids, in particular RNAs, the sugar regions are relatively inaccessible by NMR due to the close proximity of these signals to the water residents. But with these modifications, you're actually able to um, shift a lot of these resonances far enough away from the water that uh, the, the signals are relatively unperturbed by the water suppression. And shown here is an example, these are the proton carbons from the 2 primal methyl region. Uh, we can also do a fluorine detected uh, fluorine uh, proton uh, measurement. And once again, uh, this is due to the non-native chemistries of the short oligonucleotide therapeutics that we can actually use this technique. And what's really nice about fluorine is that it, it is virtually background free in that none of the excipients or uh, buffers contain fluorine. So the only signals that you'll see here are actually from the model siRNA. And so these are very nice uh, correlations to have. All right, so in conclusion, the 2D NMR methods, they offer improvements in resolution and selectivity, um, but they come at the cost of a slightly longer experiment time. So in the case of the proton nitrogen correlations, these experiments tend to take around half a day to one and a half days. Um, the proton carbon correlations can be acquired in as little as an hour for the two primal methyl region, um, and as long as four hours for the aromatic region. Um, and then the HF correlations, these can take uh, probably around four to eight hours, uh, and the same thing for the proton phosphorus correlations. Okay, so all the data I've shown so far has been on our model siRNA. What do these data actually look like on a FDA-approved um, uh, drug? So to answer that, we have a simulated siRNA drug product uh, give us siren, which is shown here. Give us siren contains a lot of the same chemical modifications that were represented in the model siRNA, including two prime O methyls and two prime fluoros and phosphorothiol linkages. Uh, an additional uh, feature of give siren is that it contains this L96 Galnac ligand that's conjugated at the three prime end of the sen strand, and this is to aid in drug delivery. So this uh, L96 ligand is, is unique to give osiren uh, in comparison to the model siRNA. Shown here are the 1D NMR fingerprints of give osiren. As you can see, they report on a variety of structural features, both at the base, in the case of the amino proton region, the sugar, as shown here with the two prime fluoros and the backbone. I'm showing both the phosphate and the phosphorothiolates. The 2D NMR data set uh, that I've, I'm showing here, these are the amino correlations. And as you can see, everything is nicely uh, resolved. You have the U's resonating around 160 to 165 ppm in the nitrogen chemical shift, and all the G's resonate around 145 to 150 ppm in the nitrogen chemical shift. And here we have a proton carbon uh, fingerprint, this is actually of the Galnac ligand. So this is unique to uh, give us siren in, in comparison to the model siRNA. So we're actually able to get a fingerprint of that um, Galnac ligand. So in conclusion, um, I hope I've convinced everyone that NMR spectra can serve as stru structural fingerprints of oligonucleotide therapeutics. One of the uh, great things about this class of molecules are that their relative simplicity allows for their chemical shift assignment, which is something that's lacking in um, a lot of the uh, monoclonal antibody work, just due to their large size and complexity. These NMR methods can be tailored to report on both native and non-native chemistries. And based on uh, their distribution throughout the oligonucleotide, they provide high-resolution information on structure and dynamics. 
The structure of the oligo nucleotides is encoded in their peak positions and intensities, all of which can be leveraged through chemometric analysis to detect subtle perturbations in structures and stability. And this work, we hope, will uh, be able to um, aid in the drug development and distribution process. Here are a brief list of references, um, should anyone want to read more. And with that, I'd like to thank the event organizers, as well as my uh, two mentors here at IBBR, Dr. Robert Brinson and Dr. John Marino. I'd also like to thank some of our collaborators, so Dr. Jace Jones and Ann Tran at University of Maryland, uh, Baltimore, for their uh, complimentary math spec work on this project, and also Dr. Christina Berganzo, who's done a lot of uh, computational work to uh, help out with this project. And with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have for me. Thank you.